I still remember moving to Beirut. It was 1998, and I was under the impression that Beirut was and would always be the way it was in my memory as a kid. Perfect, golden, the Europe of the Middle East. That same summer, clashes began. Explosions, signals that lit up the sky. We were cut off from electricity, water. There is a shortage of almost everything. My mom would sit with my sister and I in the dark and tell us her stories of her escapades during the Civil War, what she described as the best and worst years of her life. I listened to her terrified. Would that be my life? Would those be my stories? I won't get into the insignificant details of the political uprisings and struggles that came after that. For me, that holds much less importance than what came as a result of that struggle. What I will linger on is a notion that hits a chord with every Lebanese person, which I feel people all around the world can connect to. And that's how quickly and adamantly we rise from the ashes of those struggles and kickstart ourselves back to life, back to growth, every time something pulls us down. As aspiring artists and designers, we clung on to our emotion and we threw it into the only form of expression we knew how at the time. Expression, painting, art, communication. That was our salvation from the turmoil of the outside world. It was what brought us peace. A lot of people would find their own morphines of how to break out of the conflicts, but for us, this was what made sense. And soon enough, it became our driving force for change. Growing up, the internal wars left a lot of people hopeless. Even as a student studying design, it was a challenge for my classmates and I to define ourselves in the region, let alone the world. While battles took place in politics, we faced our own battles in our arts, struggling to create forms of expression that could communicate our feelings and move people as well. As much as we tried to break free from our social situation, it followed us, it haunted us. How could we change our country's history? How could we shape beliefs and perspectives that had been taken on since before we were even born? How could we define ourselves and call ourselves artists in a society that preached that the idealistic approach to life was to be a doctor or a lawyer or a businessman or a politician? I think we even felt hopeless a lot of the times. So we would push our dreams down to try to stay mainstream enough so we could feel like we accomplished anything at all. That's what reality does to you. It pulls you down. It takes you back to that checklist, ticking the boxes of what you're meant to be doing, rather than what you want or are destined to do. Maybe as artists, as dreamers who aspire to change the world, even if it brought us no wealth or stability whatsoever, had no place in this structured mold. So what do you do when you feel you have nothing worth fighting for, and everything and everyone who stands in your path stands to tell you that you're destined to fail? So we did what we could. We graduated, got jobs, continued to further studies. A lot of us left Beirut, but we never really left it behind. In a time where we had every reason to break down, to give up, to follow in our parents' footsteps and build something with our passion abroad, it was for those same reasons that we found, found every motivation to give back to our city. You could feel like something was stirring in Beirut at the time, something different, people were itching for a change. We had been deprived of voice, and now, through various forms of expression, people were starting to kickstart their dreams into realities. Whether through music, art, journalism, business and social enterprises, any medium to express themselves, giving Beirut the courage it needed to restart. Our role at the time was try to find that inspiration and evolve it, and to use it to our advantage. It was on April 8th, 2012, that my fellow graduates and I spray painted our name, designers, on the first staircase we ever painted and established our NGO, Paint Up, on the streets of Beirut. It was in that moment, in our paint frenzy, in our exhaustion, in our adrenaline, that we found purpose. We didn't know at the time exactly how much power color had to transform the way people live and the way they treat each other. We knew there were many things about our government, our society, our politics, our culture that we couldn't change. But we could change one thing. And that was how people saw Beirut, literally. 
because we did share one thing, and that was our public space. Storytelling is such a huge part of our culture. So we set out to write our own stories using our city as our canvas. We aim to never leave a place the same way we found it and to have those spaces speak for themselves even when we weren't there. Our paint interventions throughout Beirut continued. It was as if we had found a new language, a new way of communicating with people in Beirut. Suddenly, they could take pride in their city. They didn't just look to our painted spaces as landmarks, but they saw it as their companion. People came down and set up bazaars and barbecues. They brought us coffee, invited us into their homes. Musicians would set up stands and perform music, spreading their own talent and expression. At night, we would find groups of friends, young couples, gathered on these spaces, filling these, these streets with their own smiles and laughter and stories. They were using this as a mechanism for their own growth, and it was astounding. In that moment when we felt like we were changing our history and we were rewriting our stories of our generation, we, we saw that we, could have, we had that power, we had that motivation to actually give people that love that they had forgotten about their city, all those spaces and alleyways that they had somewhat ignored. Maybe somewhere along the way when you grow up in somewhat of an underserved community or a war-torn country, you lose that touch of magic that comes with that unconditional love for your country, and you lose the conviction to defend it. And us wanting so badly to bring that magic back into our own lives, into our city, we fought our hearts out through paint, through color, such a simple medium, to give people back that commitment to a country that they had somewhat given up on. To remind them why their city, their home, could not be ignored. You know, only a week ago, my team and I, we got some news that one of the landowners of one of our staircases was going to demolish it, to put up a high-rise building. It broke our spirits. We couldn't understand why, as hard as we tried to fight to protect these jewels of our city, that someone, something had to stand in our way to remind us that at any moment it could all be torn down. I sat there thinking that here I was, about to give a talk on how to never give up, when in that moment I felt helpless. That night, while scrambling to find a solution, a way to save this space, the, the emails flooded in again from people all around the world. Just like people had emailed us before from all around the world as well, and especially in the Middle East, in Egypt, in, in Syria, and Turkey, all in spite of their political struggles, telling us how they were inspired to move themselves. And once again, they were moving. They were going to set up a sit-in at our staircase. They were bringing politicians and news reporters and signs, and they did everything in their power to stop this from happening. I realized in that moment that this physical entity, as much as it had become part of the urban fabric of our community, was now only a physical representation of what it was that our initiatives really aimed to do, which was to bring people together, differences aside, for the common goal of protecting a space that they felt proud of. And that's exactly what they did. We create, they destroy, we recreate. Breaking us down was only feeding our appetites to want to continue to rebuild from the ground up again and again and again. There were many times where we just wanted to be normal, where we wanted to go about our daily lives, complain about the trivialities of work and life, listen to commercial music, rebel against religion, and just ignore and ignore. But Beirut wouldn't let us. Post-war conflict wouldn't let us. Our parents' stories and their parents' stories wouldn't let us. The congestion, the suffocation, the oppression wouldn't let us. Our anger and love towards the city wouldn't let us. And Beirut's inability to change on its own inspired us and gave us the thirst to want to change it ourselves. It's an exhilarating feeling to love something, even when you don't have the stomach for it. Even when you feel that in that moment you have nothing left to lose and only everything to gain. We take pride in that fear now because it gave us the courage to really dig down and talk to our city and listen to what it had to say. We may have been deprived from many of the social norms growing up, but a lot's changed since I was that kid in 1998 who listened to my mom's stories and whose greatest fear was to live through what my parents did and whose only goal was to leave everything behind. So to that man who tried to break us down and to break down everything that we built and what we stand for, 
you lost. And to those that will surely follow, you'll also lose. This is our time to restart, to create new stories to tell our kids, to bury the monsters and enforce amnesia, and to build landmarks that will inspire people to build victories that no one in the world can ever tear down. Thank you.